Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly talk about the differences between modernism and postmodernism. Now, quite a number of times people have posed this question to me through the comments. And even though there are quite a few videos available on postmodernism, there isn't one that compares the two. Now, please keep in mind that all my views are informed by, of course, my readings, and none of these are my original views. But whatever I understand, the most important thing to keep in mind is that postmodernism, as the scholars suggest, does not mean that modernism is over and a thing called postmodernism has emerged. Postmodernism actually does not have an episteme of its own. It rather plays with modernism and builds up on the practices and tropes of modernism. Now that implies that we need to understand roughly what modernism is in order to really get what postmodernism is. Now some of the major aspects of modernist fiction, if you look at it carefully, are pretty clear, right? Most modernist work tend to offer themselves as highly crafted, deeply elusive, serious works. They also offer themselves as high literature. If you pick up any modernist novel, Ulysses, any of Faulkner's novel, even Hemingway, Virginia Woolf, none of these novels claim to be simplistic. They have experimentations of style. They have experimentations of point of view. You have to figure out who is saying what and why, right? So pretty much all postmodernist works are written to be complex, tend to be deeply elusive. You have to find out what is being alluded to. And they tend to offer themselves as highly specialized works of fiction in a strong distinction from what would be considered popular fiction. That is why in modernism there is a clear distinction between high art and what is the popular art or low art forms. Now, another important thing about modernism to keep in mind, and this comes from Brian McHale, who has a book on postmodernist fiction, is that in most modernist novels, there is a secret hidden. And you have to figure out through the act of reading what the novel reveals to you. The great example of it, of course, is Absalom, Absalom, right? In the beginning of the novel, it's a Faulkner novel. Miss Rosa has called Quentin for a meeting and she has to share something with him and we have to read the whole novel to figure out what that is. Now also most modernist novel obviously have irony in them but they tend to be deeply serious. They take themselves seriously right, and offer a serious representation of the world. These are some of the tropes of modernism that you can keep in mind. Now, postmodernism, on the other hand, is more playful, right? And it is more intertextual. By playful, I mean that it would sometime parody another work. By intertextuality, I mean that the postmodernists have no qualms about borrowing from other works, even incorporating works from fiction characters from other literature into their own, or even simply emulating the style of someone else. Think of uh, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. Anyone who reads it would tell you that the beginning, like a child telling his own story before he was born, was lifted straight from Tristram Shandy, right? Has correspondences with Gunther Grass's Tin Drum, right? And then the comparison of Salim Senai to Shehrzad telling a story. All of these are the intertextual elements of a postmodernist text. But according to Brian McHale, another important aspect of postmodernism is that the dominant 
the focus of the novel is no longer about knowing about who is saying what, but rather about existence itself. What kind of a world is it? Do we live here or in alternative reality? So the closest genre fiction to postmodernism is science fiction. Parody is also another important part of postmodernist fiction. And by parody, I mean that they could parody a historical character, they could parody another novel, and that playful rendering of something serious also forms a huge part of postmodernist fiction. Most importantly, there is no distinction between high and low art. Most of the cases, postmodernist fiction appropriates the low art or lowers the standards of high art. So there is this unapologetic rendition of and appropriation of popular fiction, popular tropes, popular ideas. Now, another aspect that was kind of completely eliminated in modernism was the metafictional part of the novel. A modernist novel usually will not point to, hey, I am now going out of the story to give you a historical account of this or that. Or let's take you to that other city where other characters are doing this. The 19th century novel, the realist novel, did that. Postmodernism reincorporates metafictionality in a very interesting form. So what ends up happening is that sometimes you'll get out of the narrative and you'll get this aside which tells you, oh, I went to this city uh, 10 years ago and this is what was going on. And then that metafictional part of the novel has a bearing on the narrative. If you read Salman Rushdie's Shame, there are passages towards the end of it where the narrator relates his own experiences in Pakistan and Karachi, which have got nothing to do the, with the fictional part of the novel but they bear upon the fictional part of the novel. So metafictionalism or metafiction plays a huge role. And then there is something called historiographic metafiction. That's a term by Linda Hutchin. What that means is that, that parts of history as narrated in the novel are also inserted within a given fictional work as metafictional parts. So these are some of the other distinctions that make the postmodernist novel or postmodernist no writing different from mod modernist writing. And then there is the element of pastiche. Now pastiche is a kind of reappropriation of an earlier work or an earlier trope, but it is kind of an homage, a serious appropriation and not necessarily a parody. So any time a postmodernist author or a writer takes something from an earlier writer and then renders it in a different form, in a different story, that is what we call pastiche. There are quite a few other things, too, that are pertinent to postmodernism itself. And please do keep in mind that the biggest book, of course, the most prominent book, was by Leotard, right, on postmodernism, which was the first of the books that came out and in which he, he calls it a report on the postmodernist condition. Its claim mainly was that in postmodernism we cannot resort to any grand narratives. So like the grand narrative of a centered human being, which was part of modernism. After all, how will you feel alienated if you didn't have a centered self? The grand narrative of science, progress, modernity, all of these were part of the modernist fiction. They are no longer sustainable in postmodernism because new knowledges have emerged, right? New ways of looking at the world have emerged. People who were traditionally silenced now are asserting their own voices and their own opinions. So postmodernism then is more towards giving us a melange, right? Different voices, uh, different ways of looking at the same truth. So increasingly it becomes in, impossible in a postmodernist text to give us a singular worldview or a singular way of living. And a lot of postmodernist texts then, you know, try to 
represent that. Another important thing that people always, always refer to is self-reflexivity. Now, a modernist text will never point to its own being a fiction. You know, you pick up any modernist novel, they offer themselves as finished products, as highly technically honed projects, but they never point to their own fictionality. A postmodernist text would often sometimes point to its own fictionality, its own being a novel. I always use the example of Italo Calvino's A Fun of Winter's Night, A Traveler, which starts with, you know, you've just bought Italo Calvino's new novel. If on a winter's night, a traveler, right? But there could be other examples, too, in which a novelist within the project of the novel itself points to the act of storytelling itself, right? And that is what makes the postmodernist fiction self-reflexive, reflecting on itself being a work of fiction. So overall then, I mean, these are just some general points that I'm talking about. The important things to keep in mind is that modernism and postmodernism seep into each other. There is no moment where modernism ends and postmodernism starts, right? Modernism enables the postmodernist ways of doing things, writing things, and dealing with things. A lot of it is because the world has become more complex. The world has become probably more egalitarian. That's why that distinction between high and low can no longer be maintained. And more and more voices are entering the arena of expression. And postmodernism kind of captures that, right? And that playfulness is also post-1960s, this idea of challenging the historical mainstream narratives or philosophical beliefs that are centered and dominant and offer themselves as the truth. The whole question of truth is put under erasure, right? Truth itself becomes relative or becomes dependent on so many different permutations and postmodernism captures that and tries to represent that. These are some of my thoughts on postmodernism. A very brief overview of what are the differences between modernism and postmodernism and how postmodernism develops from modernism but then has different permutations you know, in the world and in literary fiction. I hope this was useful to you. Let me know what you think and if you have any questions, not too complicated ones, please post them in the comments and I'll try to answer them. Hope you're staying safe, take care, take care of each other, and I will now see you next time. Until then, as always, peace and love.